I'm the Director of Northern Agriculture with the University of Sydney, and I'm based at Narrabri. And today we're hosting our first webinar in the DigiFarm Expo, and we were hoping to have a field day yesterday. We look at all sorts of digital technologies in the paddock, and then follow it up with a face-to-face -face forum in here in Narrabri. And, but unfortunately, due to COVID, we're obviously unable to do that. So we've broken this up into four sessions, and this morning's the first session. And, and we'll be asking you at the end, or if you'd like during, if you've got any topics specifically that you'd like us to cover, it would be quite easy to uh, uh, potentially organise another webinar on a specific topic. We could find the relevant experts, get them together. So if you have, do have any suggestions on other topics, well, we'd love to hear from you. And we're also hoping we can still do our field event on the 6th of April. We're just waiting to see what happens here in New South Wales with COVID and back to school and what happens and whether we'll be, will it be possible to do that and still do a field visit for those who could make it potentially on the 6th of April. So I would, first of all, would like to do uh, an acknowledgement of country before we begin. I would like to acknowledge the Gamilaroi people who are the traditional custodians of this land where we meet today here in Narrabri where I am and pay respects to elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge and pay respects to other traditional custodians and elders of the lands occupied by all our Zoom participants. I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land which continue to be important to all Aboriginal people today. So welcome everybody. I welcome those that are here live and I also welcome everybody and thank everyone who will take the time to listen to this recording later on in their own time. You're welcome to put questions in the chat and we'll have questions at the end. In essence, the speakers are speaking for 15 minutes and there's five minutes of question time. So questions in the chat, we'll all ask for questions at the end. And without any further introduction, I'll move to our first speaker. So our first speaker is Professor Alex McBratney, who's a professor of digital agriculture and, and soil science. And Alex has made major contributions to soil science and agriculture through the development of pediometrics, digital soil mapping and precision agriculture. And amongst many other accolades, he's been elected as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. He's certainly been uh, familiar with our farming landscape in Northwest New South Wales, having visited it many times for as long as I can remember, which is possibly around 30, 40 years. Today, Alex will be talking about the, the role of digital agriculture. So please welcome Alex. Hey, thanks Guy, I'll just uh, share my screen and uh, get this thing going. Um, Right, let me just project that. Uh, can everybody see that? All good? Okay. Um, um, I should, I, I acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation whose ancestral lands I'm, gi I'm giving this talk from. Um, as Guy said, I think it's been, I think, 1985 was the first time I went to Narrabri. Um, so even though I've got this accent, I've been here for a long time. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about the role of digital agriculture. And while I remember, I just want to thank Guy for, for all the work he's done in this DigiFarm project. He's been the glue that's kept this, uh, that instigated the, the uh, programme and has kept it together through the last three years. Um, so thanks very much, Guy. Um, today, as I said, I'm gonna talk about uh, the role of digital agriculture, uh, a little bit of history about, about how it's evolved and how it is evolving. Uh, but I'll answer the question, what is the role of digital agriculture? Well, it's to provide high quality information for making timely, and, and spatial, spatially relevant management decisions, I think. Um, but let's just go a little bit into the history of digital agriculture um, in the context of 
Digiform and of, uh, and of Narbroi, actually. So I wanted to go back to 1993 because in 1993, um, we were doing some work at Narbroi at the research station using TDR to measure soil moisture. And we had state of the art 144 moisture sensors in a, in a paddock just out by the research station buildings there. Um, they were all connected up um, and re recording soil moisture. And uh, that photo on the left there can I'll tell you roughly where we had these things sent, uh, uh, set up. But the area that we could cover was only about, you know, 35 metres square because everything had to be connected oh, yeah. by wires to a central processor. So back in 1993, we could, mo we could monitor soil moisture um, in great detail. And uh, those maps there show you, you can see the soil drying out in a, on a couple of occasions. And uh, we could model that uh, moisture variation over time. Um, that's how it changes over time at one particular location, or we can map the soil moisture on a particular day, this day being September the 3rd, 1993. So we could do fairly reasonably sophisticated things. And, and the model we used here, regression tree, is what people would now call machine learning. So we could do all that back in 1993. So this kind of represents what you might call first generation digital ag. We called it precision ag in those days. We had a few sensors, largely yield monitors, but not much else. And there was certainly limited networking and no, no cloud, you know, nothing to hold all that data together. So it was gathered and moved around on disks, basically. Um, so let's move on to 2019. So we moved on a few years almost 30 years later. And you can't be too precocious. That work in 1993 was a bit too early to be have impact, but it was done. We're back in 2019, back to Narrabri. We've got Digifarm now, and lots of partners, lots of activities, and lots of sensors. And the sensors is the main thing I, I talk about a little bit here. And we just acknowledge that Digifarm is funded by the National Land Care Programme. And we see Rebecca there uh, talking to a tin can with a, an aerial on it. Um, <laughs> but in, in this, it, by 1990, uh, 2019, we've got lots of sensors. So on this Digifarm, we, we say here, we've got at least 150 sensors on, La, on Lara, which is our, our, our farm next to the research station, measuring soil moisture, but we're also measuring all kinds of things, wildlife and so on, uh, across the whole thing. We're interested in the crops, the pastures and the biodiversity and, the, and in the natural landscape. So we're looking at everything. Um, here's what we're flying the drones. Here we're measuring EM on a drone, largely to try and measure soil moisture across the paddock. We're still working on making that actually work. Um, lots of drones, lots of sensors. Um, we're looking at animals. Uh, we've got autonomous uh, vehicles now as well. And so that all comes together. And just to, to give you a, a slightly different example from the earlier one, here we're here. This is not exactly at Narrabri, but for the south, and this is from Tom Bishop, where we've got We've got soil moisture networks in place and all the data is being networked to um, central place. And that, that allows us to do um, what we call now casting or forecasting of soil moisture across, re across farms and across regions. And that's very powerful for particularly both in dry land and irrigation to drive uh, management about sowing crops and all kinds of management uh, interventions. So we can do so much more. So Digifarm represents to me 
what I would call second generation digital agriculture, where you've got lots of sensors in, the, in and above the ground, in the air, on machines, on animals, sensing of crops, sensing of vegetation, of the soil, of insects, of animals. And the great thing is that these sensors are networked. They're all the information's going to some sort of central location. And we've got much more advanced computation with machine learning, but I've also said, hopefully with real learning as well, people learning things, uh, not just machines learning things. And of course, we've got autonom some autonomous operations and particularly robots. I think the biggest contribution we've made um, in the DigiFarm and also in the second generation digital ag is a lot about developing the sensing principle. And there is a sensing principle. And the sensing principle is that you've got a lot of variation, real variation out there in the field, variation in the plants, in the animals, and in the soil. But if you can put out lots of low cost, low precision sensors, they don't need to be high precision. We can produce a high value, spatialized agricultural and environmental information, which you can is suitable for management interventions. So lots of sensors don't need to be high, high precision, but because they are all out in the same place, they kind of help each other to produce a picture of what's happening. And this really is an example of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Get lots of sensors out there, even though they're not producing the perfect information and we can learn quite a lot. So now I just want to quickly say, well, where are we headed now with digital agriculture? I think um, DigiFarm is a good example of this second generation. Where should we take DigiFarm into the future? Where's digital agriculture headed? Well, if we just go back a second, the first generation was really about sensors and precision ag. The second generation is sensors, precision ag, a lot more about field robotics or autonomous systems and data analytics. We've got a lot more sophisticated data analytics to tell you what that spatial data means. Um, when we get to the third generation, I think we need to think more about digital logistics of products and digital supply chains. We need to extend it uh, a little bit beyond the farm gate. In fact, all the way to the consumer. I think we wanted something that connects to the consumer. Um, so that's what I see as third generation digital lag. If we write the same thing as a supply chain, we can see we can go from the farm with its precision ag, field robotic sensors, and data analytics. And then when you go beyond the farm gate, you get into digital logistics, digital supply change, and digitally en enabled consumers. Consumers being able to, you know, with a smart device, learn a lot about the products they're trying to buy um, uh, in the supermarket or, or wherever, online even. So I think the digital lag of the that we need to develop will be all the way along the supply chain. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do to say, to take your product from the farm into a, a digital supply chain to a targeted, probably a targeted customer or consumer. Um, so that's what I see as third generation. And that's where we need to be headed with all this. And why, why do we want to be headed in that direction? Well, I'll explain in a minute. So as Guy, Guy has championed and I've worked on, we are building up a, a building for this third generation digital ag, a digital ag building at, at our Narrabri research station, which, can, which will go on to develop this kind of um, new kind of agriculture. Um, the third generation will be what I call a digitally decommoditized agriculture. In other words, selling very highly, much more highly specific, um, specific products from your farm. Um, 
se segregated products through specialized supply chains. So basically that will work by recognizing and measuring and segregating trait diversities on the farm and putting that segregated product and the, and the associated data through the supply chain. I think that gives added value for the producer. You're making a specialized product rather than a commodity and you're producing a specialized product for consumers. This uh, added value, it can give the incentive for enhanced environmental management. So part of the data that goes through the supply chain is your environmental credentials. That will lead to some kind of digital regenerative agriculture, I think. This will have feedback loop, loops from consumers to producers. And at the same time, with all of that happening, we'll try and make it carbon positive. In other words, we are bringing in more carbon than we are uh, emitting in the whole system. So that's where the digital act, and dig digital enables all of that. There's nothing to stop us doing all that with, with a digital outlook. Um, so the future will be, will be de designing and implementing the e-food fiber chain. Um, we'll still have all those sensors on farm. We'll have some more sensors to able to segregate products that we don't have at the moment. And we'll be talking a lot, an awful lot about provenance or terroir knowing where our food and fiber comes from and exactly how it's grown, that will be part of the information of all food and fiber products. And the, the, the driving concerns of that, um, particularly to the consumer, is about health, the environment, and about ethics. So digital will drive that into the future. Um, a couple of years ago, before the world went, <laughs> Before that, it seemed like we were at the end of the world. But, but, um, we ran a conference about the future of digital agriculture, which we called STEDA. Um, everything's been offline. Um, hopefully that will return. We, we need a conference, not just about the, uh, all the products are out there to do digital ag, but, but a conference around the ideas the science and the technology, and the engineering and the economics to drive digital agriculture in the future. So hopefully that will return in a year or so. And um, with that, I just want to uh, thank everybody for listening. Um, that's our digital farm, or one of them anyway. That's our farm at Narbri. And uh, of course, that symbol there that says soil is, is created by digital agriculture in some way and, and thanks to Kyron for doing that and um, just like to thank all our partners who've been working with us on this digital ag and who will be talking at various points and I, and I purposely didn't show a lot of results because they will be coming from all our partners and collaborators in subsequent uh, talks so now I'm going to stop sharing and I've enjoyed sharing with you, but I'm handing back now to Guy. Thanks, Guy. Thank you, Alex. Well, if anyone has a question, they could uh, slip it into the chat bar. Okay. Uh, try and synthesize that and, and, uh, and answer that. That would be good. Uh, 1993, well, I can remember 1991, <laughs> Narrabri. Yeah. January 1991, 40 degrees Celsius, and the Gulf War started. Right. And we saw those images of missiles going down chimneys, <laughs> wondering how did they do that? And I think I'll be pretty right out here at the back of Narrabri for a while. And that was when we all learned about global positioning systems. Yeah, yeah. We didn't really know about that prior to that. And well, yeah. we've come a long way. Now we you pretty much buy a GPS and a tractor like you buy an air conditioner. Yeah, it was, ar it was around 1995, so yeah. a bit after that, that we started to do some yield mapping up at up at Moree. So this has all taken 30 or 40 years, you know, yeah. the, the adoption of no-till farming, it's taken a long time. If you fast forwarded like 10, 15 years or even 20, what will the, 
what what will we what 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 the future look like? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, you can have a try. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody else, when when anybody asks you that question, the answer is I've got no bloody idea. <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> but all we'll we'll have tens of thousands of sensors out there and they'll all be talking to each other and measuring all kinds of things. And uh, we will be growing very specialised products, I think, and they will be going into the market. And, and, and our, our cust consumers will, will also be as interested in the environmental products that we are, or the environmental status of our farms than they are in the products, equally interested. And that's why you have to tie those two things together. The product that you that you're offering needs to have environmental credentials, and that's kind of and how do we create those credentials and get them to the consumer so that they realise that they are real credentials? So, um, I think the farms will be much more diverse in terms of what what we're doing on the farms. Much more small areas with more diversity, which will all be enabled by the fact that we can do things autonomously that's my guess and uh, in terms of all time I mean, one of the issues people talk about is conductivity and people like to have a whinge about that but and we've got a speaker later on about you know, conductivity but i seen this this we had the sensors and couldn't as you said we didn't have the cloud and now we've got the cloud will there be some improvement in some of the sensors as well uh with, like but, well, uh, well, one principle is lots of sensors, they don't need to be that fancy. The more you have, it's better to have, it's better to have lots of cheap ones than one or two uh, really good ones. But, but yeah, there'll be improvement, there'll be improvement, but there, 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 there will inevitably be improvement in the sensors. But the sensors that we need to develop are the ones that measure the quality of this, the quality of the product. You know, you need to be able to, you know, measure specialized traits, not just the protein content, but perhaps the, the kind of protein, the kind of carbohydrates, uh, the fiber strength, a lot more about the fiber length, strength, thickness. We need, we need, those, we need those quality characteristics and per, maybe uh, trace metals for grains, you know. Yeah. Things that say something about the nutrition that kind of thing. And we can kind of do that now, but we need to make that kind of part of everyday everyday life. Well, I think in your area, people will want to know about soil carbon, won't they? But, uh, absolutely. It's a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've and, got a couple, uh, there's a couple of questions here uh, related in a way, and I probably apply to the other speakers, but what are the very first basic affordable things that farmers can do to start to get our farms digitally digitally prepared. Um, I, I, I think making I, I, I think making a digital um, what I call it the, the data cube of your farm. In other words, get it get all the data that you have for your farm to translate it into a data cube so that you can start making management decisions even without having any sensors. You can still make a data cube for your farm, and that will allow you to do to do management zoning and management decisions. And then it will also tell you where where to put all the sensors. So I think creating a data cube of your farm is the first thing I would do. And is that something easy to do? Like, could I do that if someone taught me? I mean, if I I think, I, I, I think that the, the, yeah, I think the ability to do that is much easier. And, and it's a, and making a data cube is a combination of publicly available data and, and your own private data, which I'm not advocating goes into a public realm, but rather you, you bring in the public data and merge it with your private data and create your own data cube. It might be that somebody else creates it for you, yeah. but, it's, but it's your data cube. Okay. Well, I'll just, there's a couple of questions here around provenance. Right. Which is clearly important. Yeah. And uh, both ex export markets, domestic markets. Yeah. How will transparency from field sensors to buyers improve? 
to increase that trust? How can uh, I think I know what the question is getting at here? Yeah, yeah I, 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 so I think there's got to be so we, we've got to somehow or other fingerprint the product and have that fingerprint travel with the product digitally. And I think and, and I think we've got some good ideas about how to do that. And it, obviously that can't be too, that can't cost $10,000. You know, it has to be a, a cheap solution to that problem. But that's what we need to do. We need some fingerprinting of the product and the environment that can travel with the product. Um, uh, and maybe it's intrinsic to the product. Uh, uh, but can travel digitally in the supply chain as well. So, but I, I can see how we can, I think we, I think we can do that. We can probably do that now. Um, well, I think, well, obviously some, we've actually got David and Daniel Statham who are yeah. gonna talk about one example of that in cotton in the, in the yeah. session four of this series on the 24th of February. The pro so provenance be will be, Provenance is the same as quality, it's, it's the other side of the same coin as quality assurance. You know, people want to know how things are grown, where they come from, but they also want to know that it's a, it's the real product. They also want to know that it's a quality product. Yeah. All of those things go together. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank well, you. I can give you a clap. I'm not sure if anybody else can, but I, uh, <laughs> we appreciate that. And I'm, and I'm sure more people will listen to this online as well. But thank you very much for the introduction and, and, and uh, thanks. stay tuned. So now I'd like to move to the second speaker or speakers plural in this webinar, where we'll have some examples, really a showcase of around about 10 farmers in Northwest New South Wales who are, who are doing something related to digital agriculture. And it is a broad, church so um we have both kate pierce and george truman from northwest local land services who are going to present to uh two ronnies here and present it together and they're both uh, mixed farming and extension advisory offices in, in northwest new south wales with local land services and got a, a lot of experience and um kate's based up in moree while george is based in Gunnada. So I'd like to welcome both Kate and George. Hey. Thank you, Guy. Can you hear me? Is that all good? We can. Well, I can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as Guy mentioned, my name is Kate Pearce and I work with the Northwest LLS based out of Moree. Um, and my colleague, George Truman, as Guy also mentioned, works out of Gunnada. Um, today, we'll be going through a snapshot of these satellite sites, satellite demonstration sites um, run with producers. And they really couldn't be what they are without the producers' efforts and feedback. Um, so that's just a, a big shout out to them and a thank you to them for, for all their hard work and, and what they put into this, this work, because it's what makes it what it's what makes it at the end of the day um so as i said we'll be going through a snapshot of these demonstration sites on behalf of our team who george and i are only two of the six um so there are a lot of other people a part of this team that work hard on all of these demonstration sites and we're just representing it for them for today so there may be some questions at the end that we may not be able to answer but i'm sure we'll get we'll get the feedback back to you um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I will give a little intro on how this all came about um, and we'll go through the first half of the satellite sites looking at the livestock tech and some feral pig collaring um, and then I'll pass over to George to finish up on the remainder looking at weed mapping, some soil water work, seed probe work and so on. Um, so as Alex mentioned, um, the Digifarm project is funded through the Australian Government Smarter Farming Partnership, which is run as part of the National Land Care Program. Oops, sorry, Guy. Just having a little, there we go. Um, and Northwest Local Land Services has teamed up with the University of Sydney to run a series of these demonstration sites across the Northwest region to showcase the latest in agriculture technology and how it can be adopted for our Northwest farming systems. 
As said before, it's a collection of sub-projects that combine research with a focus of improving uptake of digital agriculture, both by utilising extension and research. We have been looking at, wh at which and whether technologies are suitable now and also whether they are likely to remain suitable in the future and how commercially viable and applicable they are in real time. A key part of this project is, as I said before, is working with farmers. Um, these satellite sites are all about making it as real and as useful as we can. Um, to get these farmers' feedback is so, so vital and important to the purpose of it. Testing it with these farmers um, to support their experiences so that everyone benefits from the technology. It's a, a, a sample of certain tech and um, I mean, there's plenty of research behind the tech that we're going to, to show today, but we found that we had cherry picked what we have, what we've got to work with and what we're showcasing um, purely because we didn't see a huge amount of work done in our patch commercially to make it relative to our growers. Um, and we needed to do this to cut through the research, to cut through the noise of a lot of the data, to find out what technology makes a difference for our farmers' businesses. Um, so within LLS, we're looking to the future um, and how we can help farmers in our roles, because it's a big part of our job as ag advisory, um, to do that background research so that, you know, farmers' time, A, they don't have it, but it's not getting tied up in doing a lot of trial and error work with these technologies to find out those use, useful options um, so that we can share that with the wider farming community. And as I said, it saves them a lot of time and because we know, and we know from, from this project, you know, it's taken a lot of patience with a lot of the demonstration sites to wait for that data, but it's the time needed to fine tune what, what we're achieving and what we're getting out of it. Um, so that's, yeah, I guess, as I said, it's why we're doing what we're doing to save farmers missing out or, or potentially spending money or wasting time um, where they don't need to, and we, we can cut through the noise and get through that. So that's that's it. So that's rough the rough background of the, the 10 demonstration sites. Um, we'll go through them, as I said, um, looking at, you know, just them in a really brief snapshot um, and talk about a few pros and cons from, from growers' feedback. So OptiWay, OptiWay is one of the um, one of the livestock um, demonstration sites. And as you can see, there are two active at the locations, Werris Creek and Yarry Lake. Um, Malls Creek and Bog Abrai have been um, active for the last uh, over 12 months um, and the Werris Creek and Yarra Lake have been active for, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't be sure, but I'm going to say almost close to eight or nine months. Um, so OptiWay, for those who um, aren't familiar with it, is a system that easily um, transports in paddock system. Um, it's very easy to move around in the back of a quad or a side by side um, to accurately measure and record the weight of cattle and the performance of mob over time. It was developed by a guy called Bill Mitchell, a grazier from the New England, who saw the need to monitor stock um, weight, weight and daily gain from the paddock within their own grazing enterprise. Um, a loose leaf block is um, is based in the front of the system. And just to give you some snapshots of what it looks like, um, to lure the cattle into it, but with young inquisitive animals, they have no, no drama stepping on and off these, these OptiWay machines. Um, key points to take home, um, you get good mob-based decision-making. Um, it's highly mobile and can fit into a rotational grazing system quite easily. Um, practical and easy to use, like practical and easy to use the information um, and well suited to younger animals who are very inquisitive. The next one is the walkover way. Walkover way for those who aren't familiar with it, um, used a lot up, up in, um, in Queensland and the Northern Territory. Um, walkover way system is set up on watering points to, um, to take what cattle's weight over scales before drinking, enabling their weights to be remotely recorded. The biggest gains come from minimizing weight losses. 
So the technology is more accurate guide of what the country is capable of. Um, so you can see our locations are Warialda and Bogabri, and one of our farmers has both the um, walkover way and OptiWay system on his place. Um, key points to take away, here's some piggies of the OptiWay um, set up on a trough. Um, some key points to take away for, for both of these units, um, or for OptiWay to start with, sorry, individual data collection, um, precision livestock management that you can quantity. Sorry. that you can quantity money production factors in detail, less mobile, but less reliant on voluntary attendance by the animal. A few key points to take away from both of these systems, in paddock, in paddock weighing systems um, are add an incredible insight to the power of decision-making um, and the day-to-day -day grazing management decisions for livestock. OptiWay is, a commercially available technology and we see clear path on the return of investment in the technology. Walkover waste systems are available through True Test. The units we are using are fitted with additional equipment at, that the University of Sydney is working on to increase the visibility of the data output and more information will be available over the coming months on the side-by-side -side trial of the OptiWay and Walkover Way and longer term outcomes of the OptiWay site. So yes, in the coming um, in the coming series of these Digifarm presentations, you'll see a bit more information of all of these, and especially the OptiWay with Naomi. Sheep EID sites. We have um, some new, new sheep ID sites come online as part of our Digifarm demonstration sites. Um, locations out at Walgett, I think we have two, three growers out at Walgett and maybe possibly two around Tamworth. Um, EID is the ability um, to identify animals individually. This means that you can easily track data about the animal's pedigree and performance and use it to make better management and breeding decisions throughout its life. This allows you to see which animals are exceeding expectations, but which ones are also lagging behind. Um, so yes, this project will engage two landholders, um, as I said, and they will be measuring the animal's performance metrics um, over a period of time, looking to benchmark its condition scores and um, just their general performance in those parts of the world. Feral pig collaring. So I have been um, working quite closely with a gentleman called Darren Marshall. Um, Darren Marshall works for Southern Queensland Landscapes and um, he has a very, very big research history in um, GPS tracking of feral pigs. Um, so just a little bit of a background, as you can see down here, um, that is, well, there is Lara over to, and the uni over to one side, but it, it runs, the, the valley that it runs in is the Mulgate Creek area and it runs from basically the Sydney Uni up into the hills. Um, and in that particular picture, you can see a lot of noise of the pigs moving, but just to give you a bit of a snapshot. So um, this project is funded by the local land services and the Uni um, and led by researcher Darren Marshall, as I said, and which forms a, a bigger part of a feral pig project with um, these collaring sites all over New South Wales and, and um, Queensland. The aim of this project and what's really important about it is to learn the movement patterns of, of feral pigs and their home range sizes across the landscape. Uh, this data will assist the land managers to understand where and when feral pigs are most susceptible to control measures um, and therefore a greater understanding of how um, to, make your, to make your control programs more efficient and effective. Um, we've learned a lot from, from all of this data over the time. Um, and here's a, here's a more noisy, noisy one of all the collars in the different colors um, moving around. And that, that range, if for, for those of you familiar with that area, is roughly it. And I mean, it doesn't look like 
very, very like a very far distance when you look at it on a map. But in in terms of a yeah a home range for for a, I suppose a, a pig a pig community, it's they don't seem to move that far, and that's that's one of the biggest. The biggest lessons we've learned um, and the findings from all the research I think from the further west you go they will, will walk a long way but it's purely from a water point so when it was really dry they only found that they were moving a long way but when it when it's good and they've got a lot of food and shelter they don't go very far at all and they they definitely do have a home base. Um, a lot of a lot of hard work goes into to doing this with free feeding and and getting the collars on the pigs and um, doing that all ethically and, and above board. But um, it's also a, probably a gripe from the technologies that they need to be on the pigs for a good twelve months to get this useful data, and that's probably a frustration. But at the end of the day, you're getting you're getting good information about where they are to to cater your um, your baiting programs. Um, to, to be more effective and efficient. Um, and I will pass over to George. That's, that's it on the pigs. I look forward to some questions at the end. I will hand over to George Truman to do the remainder of the satellite sites. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thanks, Kay. Um, as Guy said, I'm in uh, Ghana, so Kate's George. going to drive the uh, PowerPoint very um, presentation for me. Yes. Maybe Kate mm. needs to go on mute and. Okay. Uh. I tested it this morning and it was good. That's better now. Okay. Sorry, I did do a test run this morning and it was good. That's all right. Is that better now, Guy? Yeah. Um, so the three technologies that I'm going to um, cover off on are the soil moisture probes, or better known as sea probes, the soil water mapping and the weed mapping. As Kate mentioned, these are a team effort. Uh, the soil moisture probe work is predominantly being done by Phil Manning and myself. The soil water mapping is being done by Bill Manning and the weed mapping is Bill again and uh, with the help of Dale. So uh, all these projects are uh, team efforts. Thanks, Kate. So uh, just, uh, just quickly, the, the key points with the, um, the soil um, moisture probe mapping or work. The, uh, the probes, as we know, are um, used for measuring changes in soil moisture. Um, labour is uh, obviously a lower labour input involved apart from the installation and the maintenance. They're really useful in, in understanding the variation in soil moisture across an area with multiple probes. However, there is an increased cost with this sort of application. Um, although uh, sea probes were traditionally used in irrigation um, uh, systems. We're seeing a, a greater use of pasture probes in pastures, dryland crops and fallows. Um, however, this will depend in reductions in the cost, particularly if the industry is to move towards more spatial water management. So management of moisture in the future may well involve using a greater range of data sources, such as satellite, um, NDVI, terrestrial weather stations, um, in conjunction with moisture probes. And the technology may become linked to crop growth models. So, so there certainly is uh, looking at um, wider application of, of sea probes in these dry land and pasture systems. Thanks, Kate. So uh, one of the, one, the systems I'm working at is with a, uh, some landholders at Manila. So this is in a, a 10 year old tropical grass pasture. And it's been really useful for determining the pasture growth and planning the grazing and rest periods. The pasture cuts are also being taken to look at dry matter or kilos of dry matter per millimetre of rainfall. And with a combined data from the weather station, it's been really useful for other farm related activities such as weed spraying um, in terms of speed and direction, also humidity in terms of fire risk. So the probe here has been really um, a benefit to the landholder. We can, um, we can better forecast the spring pasture growth through the, um, through the results rather than just relying on a seasonal weather forecast. 
And this earlier predict prediction of, of growth, whether it be good or bad, can aid in um, applications or, or decisions around fertilizer application, stocking rate, and those sorts of things. The only issue with the, uh, the seed probe in the pasture paddock here is the uh, impact from the animals. So we do have to locate the actual probe about 10 metres away. It's got a buried cable uh, to where the sensor is. So hence the fence around to, um, to reduce the impact of, from the animals. Thanks, Kate. So some really useful live data. So the landholder has this on his phone so he can see the rainfall. He can see the, the probes um, down to, I think, 80 centimetres. So he can get some idea of how effective the infiltration is, um, what sort of depth that water is getting to, where the, the roots are drawing from. So it becomes a, a really beneficial um, tool in a pasture system, particularly in our tropical grass systems where they can go from, uh, you know, can have significant growth in short periods of time. So having this tool is really useful in, uh, in managing stock numbers and, uh, and when to move um, animals. So it's, um, it's been a really useful uh, tool. There's lots of different data sets you can draw from the weather station, such as soil temperature, humidity, um, various things, um, and it's data on the go. So it's, uh, it's instantaneous. Thanks, Kate. So uh, as we know, traditionally um, used in um, irrigation, but uh, Bill's work in the dryland cropping scene, so the croppers are indicating the use of probes primarily for making early decisions on applying nitrogen and other inputs um, based on estimated yield potentials. They can also get information for planting decisions on crop type, harvest options, um, whether it be hay or grain during dry periods. So uh, that's the work we're doing with the, um, in this dry land cropping space with the, uh, the guys at Manila, at um, Malali. Thanks, Kate. So uh, Bill's other major project is the soil water mapping using EMI. Now look, EMI is not new, it's been around for a long time, but I guess what's new is linking this to the soil surveys, doing soil tests, um, running some correlations. He's looking at actually um, transferring that map into what's a soil moisture map. Um, and this can aid in, uh, in management decisions with uh, nitrogen and fertilizer application and um, is really proving to be a, a useful step up from uh, just getting that that conductivity survey it's really putting some uh, some good data into these maps thanks kate so yeah as we understand i mean soil is highly variable across the paddock um, to really uh, get that, that uh, potential for variable rate agriculture, we need to be able to, to measure that variation. The possibilities for measuring soil water spatially are limited. We know soil sampling is expensive. Having a multitude of probes is expensive. So modeling that soil water accumulation during a fallow is also possible with the use of the EMI. So well, there's the potential to map the soil water during fallow and also during the crop. And, uh, and this would be really useful to, uh, to increase that uh, adoption of variable rate application of inputs um, according to soil type and moisture. Thanks, Kate. So the, uh, the last of the, uh, the satellite site work is the weed mapping. So uh, once again, uh, Bill's been really busy with this one. This one involves several steps. So. It is the, a photographic survey using a drone, uh, stitching the photos together, creating a mosaic um, by using software to identify the position of the weeds, uh, getting a GPS uh, accuracy for that map. And then those map of targets produced can be read by a spray controller to trigger the appropriate nozzles or section of a boom as the sprayer passes over the targets. So I guess the thing is here, yes, we've got uh, green seeker technology and other technology out there, but the, the positives here are a significant dollar saving. So we can adapt the technology to use in existing boom sprayers. So potentially an existing boom sprayer could become a spot sprayer. Um, and it also can provide information on the total area of the paddock that does actually require spraying. The, uh, the negatives here would be that the fact that you do need to fly the drone initially, uh, stitch the images, um, do the correction and produce the maps. 
but uh, it's already proving quite uh, quite useful and um, yeah, some interesting data and results that will come out of some of this work um, in the future. Thanks, Kate. So uh, look, that's a, that's a snapshot of the, uh, the uh, other three technologies and then combined with all the, the livestock work that Kate's been, do, been doing. I guess what we're, uh, we're keen to, to hear back from people, um, some feedback, um, sort of asking people that are watching today, producers or growers, for ideas, you know, what, what haven't we tried? Um, is there opportunities to, uh, that you've got, you're thinking about out there? that there's opportunity with the, the Digi Farm and the National Land Care Program and local land services and, and other cooperators to work together. So uh, to, to try and extend some of this technology because there's, um, a, there's a great range of staff and, and people, research organizations here in the North. So yeah, if you've got ideas out there, then look, we're really certainly um, keen to hear from you. And, uh, and I guess uh, just leading on from that, there is some current funding through the National Land Care Program uh, details are on our LLS website, um, looking at the, the role of technology in adapting to climate and markets. So uh, if you've got ideas about uh, you know, adapting to climate variability um, or market demands with new technologies, then there, are, um, there is funding, funding for industry groups, um, land care groups um, to promote this or, or undertake training or set up demonstration farms of these new technologies. So. Uh, Definitely, uh, please uh, you know, feel free to contact us um, following this webinar to if you've got some ideas to uh, so that we keep this uh, keep the uh, the interest and uh, and adoption of these new technologies um, on the go. Thanks, Thanks George. George. Thanks, George. If you could unshare the screen, uh, and Kate, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've run a little bit over time, so if you do have any questions or suggestions, as George was asking there in terms of other technologies, just put them in the chat bar or, or email us directly and we will get back to you. And look, there'll be, there's tomorrow's session, which is all about cropping, or sorry, not tomorrow, Thursday, the 17th of February, 12.30, you'll see some more about some of those cropping applications in the wild pigs. And likewise, next Tuesday, the 22nd of February, in the livestock session, you'll see some more detail around some of those livestock applications and I'd also just like to thank all the farmers who and consultants and advisors who have collaborated on that project. So thanks very much to Kate and George from Northwest Local Land Services. So now I'd like to introduce our third speaker, David Broderick, who is a control systems engineer who has been working and has worked on large science facilities such as the telescope um, here in Narrabri and particle accelerators and many others and his specialty is in real-time sensing and, uh, and systems. And David and his Narrabri based colleague, uh, Chris Allen developed the Oz forecast network, which nearly a lot of people in Northwest New South Wales use in terms of monitoring the weather. And one of the most popular networked things, I pick it up every day on my phone to check the weather and many other things, as do many others. So it's Great that uh, David can share share a bit some information here on, as his title says, how to keep your farm connected. And wouldn't we like to know that? So thanks, David. Thank you, Guy. And thank you, Christy and the other presenters. Uh, there's already been some fantastic sessions um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of good information in the days ahead. Uh, so partly what I'm doing here is just trying to lay a few more ideas about things that I think are interesting and relevant in terms of sort of instrumenting your farms. Uh, hopefully it also goes into answering the question that Wendy posed earlier about what are some of the first steps that you might do um, on farm. Uh, so briefly, I'll talk a bit about the availability and the uh, relatively low cost these days of sensors. Um, a little bit about the difference between data and information. What is it that you really want? Uh, the openness, uh, I see real benefits in terms of making information uh, openly available where you can. And then a particular technology I think is really relevant and is going to be an enabling uh, 
infrastructure as we move forward is uh, LoRa, uh, long range radio sensors. Uh, so I'll talk about each of those in turn. Um, uh, it was quite interesting, I think, Alex's talk about the, the different generations of sort of digital farming. Uh, and indeed, I certainly agree that sensors are both much more low cost, uh, but also have much higher performance uh, than has been the case in the past. And I've listed there a couple of the technologies that I think have really enabled the, the proliferation of, of low cost sensors on farm. Uh, and one of those in particular, I think, is about the communications infrastructure. So I'm sure if you think back to the day when you know, weather stations might have had the uh, weather vox that you would have to call up and you would listen to, to a voice, try and read out the information from a weather station, um, or, and you know, each of those required a landline to be laid out to where the weather station was. Or if you think about uh, sensors that you would have to go and visit once a month and offload the data manually. These days, whether you're using the Telstra or other mobile phone network or uh, an alternative communication method like this LoRa WAN, uh, then uh, it basically costs nothing. Even if you're using the mobile phone network, for a sensor in the field like this, you're looking at $5 a month or something like that. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues, of course, which is both a, a benefit and a challenge is that if you've got a lot of instrumentation on farm, you've also got a lot of data uh, that you need to wade through to, to um, make sense of that. Uh, and of course, you've already seen some good slides about uh, the kind of sensors that you might put on farm. Uh, I'd say this is sort of the most common stuff that we're involved in. Uh, so uh, a weather station, um, and of course there you've got your, your basic parameters, uh, wind speed, wind directions, rainfall, temperature, humidity, delta T and derived quantities like this, which are really very relevant for spray applications. Um, and then uh, the soil moisture and soil temperature probes. Uh, the sort of the mainstay, but there's a, a lot of other sensors available on the market, not just through us, but there'll be presentations over the coming days about some of the amazing things that are now available in this space. Um, one of the things I think it is important to take a moment to reflect on is uh, what do we mean by data and what is it we really want? So uh, if you think, for instance, uh, of having a large number of sensors set up each of those are reporting every few minutes uh, and you end up with a, uh, a massive amount of data. So for instance, if you've got a number of weather stations, maybe you end up with uh, temperature readings over a certain spatial area taken every 15 minutes. Now, is, is that really what you want though? If, if you think about, okay, you want to assess your crop maturity, probably something like day degrees you know, the, the information that you really want is not the raw data itself, but it, it's something that you might get from uh, doing something with that raw data to help you to make decisions. Uh, and I've got some examples there. It's certainly we can put uh, a moisture probe in, in the soil, uh, but what are we really going to do with that information about how the uh, moisture content varies with depth? Um, are we going to use it to help us to schedule irrigation? Um, uh, George just mentioned some, some really interesting work that Bill was doing um, about using the soil moisture probes to help inform you, the farmer, to make better decisions. Uh, likewise, the Delta T, um, it's probably not a quantity that we really care very much about, except from the point of view that we, we really want to know, is now a good time to do this spray application? And, and so that's the information that we get uh, from the raw data data quantities. Um, now, just be mindful, though, that uh, having access to good information is important for your decision making. Now, there's a few different aspects to this. One is not using bad information or sourced from bad data. There's the saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but also about how do you structure your sensor network to, to make the most of it. So 
one initiative that's worth mentioning here is we've been working with the Bureau of Meteorology on a project they call TPAWS, which is the Trusted Private Automatic Weather Station uh, Network. Now, uh, this hopefully will be something which will end up having uh, benefits for yourselves on farm in terms of the Bureau of working with CSIRO to, uh, uh, in essence, put in quality, quality assurance processes in place for your own weather stations that you have on farm. Um, and so that way they're working with the insurance industry. So that way, if you're claiming that there's been frost days or there's been you know, some other environmental condition, um, then both the Bureau of Meteorology, yourself and the insurer all have access to this sort of quality control data about your on-farm weather station. Uh, it's, it's really quite interesting stuff. Uh, and I think that will become more available maybe later this year. Uh, so some of the other thoughts, uh, Alex already mentioned kind of the spatial sampling. So where you can afford it or where you need better information, then you don't just put one moisture probe into a field. Um, uh, you might do some of some of the interesting EM scanning uh, like we've just heard about, or you put multiple uh, moisture probes or canopy temperature sensors or whatever it is across the field. Then there's also uh, generating useful information by combining different sources of information. Um, uh, machine learning is one uh, way to do that, you know, to add value to the raw data. Uh, using your own neural network inside your head, you've also got uh, uh, Hamish and, and Pear Tree uh, bring different sources of information together and display it. You know, one of it might be commodity prices, and, something else is the, uh, uh, the the fellow moisture in your field and you're looking at those and you're making decisions based on uh, those different sources of independent information. Uh, and of course, the software tools that you use to go from the data to make uh, decisions, I already mentioned day degrees as, as one example of how you transform the data to useful information. Uh, something I'm a firm believer in is the idea of uh, making information openly available. Now, of course, there are limitations to that. If you've got a uh, soil moisture probe in an irrigated field, well, that's probably not of interest to anybody except yourself. But uh, when we think about things like weather stations in particular, then I think this is something that making that information available uh, benefits uh, benefits everybody involved. In fact, I, I don't see any reason why you, you wouldn't want to take this option. Uh, Guy already mentioned that uh, we as Oz Forecast uh, have worked with local farmers and you know, we've got a network, of, there must be hundreds of public access weather stations set up through Northwest New South Wales. And I think this really benefits everybody. Um, uh, and, and not only people on the land, but, but the, the general community. Uh, and in some ways that it in turn comes back and benefits you, uh, I mentioned there, so such as, um, if you're looking for consistency in wind direction, so if, if you're going to do a spray application, your weather station says that there's a, a northwesterly blowing, well, by having visibility of what the neighbouring weather stations say, uh, then that gives you that extra confidence, uh, similar to what the Bureau are doing in terms of a quality control metric, uh, in terms of making sure that, that the information that you're looking at and making decisions on is good information. Um, likewise, being able to use that spatial distribution of weather stations to see if the wind change is coming through. Um, and of course, it's always fun to see who got how much rain, especially as you do get these really high density of uh, networks of weather stations. Uh, in many cases, we've got them close enough together that the storm usually goes right over the top of one of them. So you can um, see, see a lot of variation between neighbouring weather stations. Uh, and on this map, the red circles show uh, sort of Oz, Oz forecast weather stations that are privately owned, but the data is publicly available. And I've just picked out uh, Drew ben Penberthy's place there as an example that if you look that up on the website, well, you don't just see Narrabri Airport, which is 50 odd Ks away, uh, but you actually see a whole number of weather stations uh, specific to that locality uh, that you can use for, for making decisions. Uh, on a related note, some of the cotton grower associations have actually really used this idea uh, as, as a driver for combating spray drift. 
Um, so they've set up networks of weather stations in the cotton growing areas um, and also uh, co-orchestrated that with training days for local growers so that people can make better decisions about when they should be spraying but also it's about the visibility of the information so uh, if, if you're out on a spray rig and everybody can see what the wind directions uh, is blowing uh, including the neighbor downwind uh, then you've got that level of exposure and accountability uh, and, and people are you know, less likely to try and get away with it, or, or at least they're better informed. Uh, and I, I haven't seen any formal write up about how this has gone. So for instance, up on the Darling Downs, uh, but anecdotally, I understand that this has been uh, really successful having that openly available weather station network. Uh, so next, I just wanted to mention something which, which I, I'm a big advocate of. Uh, which is a technology. So rather than having a, a SIM card in each of these sensors you have on your phone and needing to uh, pay a few dollars a month to offload the data from those sensors, you can actually set up a, a LoRa WAN gateway. So I mentioned LoRa is long range and then the WAN is um, wide access, a wide area network. So this is a way that basically you get a uh, a little device, a, a tin can with an antenna, uh, I think Alex said, uh, and that is the gateway. So that needs a SIM card, but then all of the other sensors that you put around the farm uh, just report back to that one node. So you might have 10 soil moisture probes, uh, but they don't need SIM cards. Instead, they just talk back to the gateway. Uh, now this, this technology, you might hear the phrase IoT or Internet of Things. Uh, this technology is really one of the, the key enabling technologies in the Internet of Things. Uh, it's useful on your farm, but it's used widely. I know Melbourne City Council has invested heavily setting up law aware gateways, and they use it for everything from turning on sprinklers on their sports fields through to telling them when uh, garbage bins are full. Yeah, um, uh, now, LoRaWAN is sort of the technology in terms of uh, the protocols that the devices use to speak to each other, but where the information actually goes. Uh, so it might be some, some people might use that technology and basically have a closed proprietary network. So, so the neighbor's sensors can't use that, that network depending on who you're sort of buying this equipment of. Uh, personally, I really like this open access model. So if you think about, so for instance, um, around Narrabri, if, if someone were to put a gateway on one of the water towers in Narrabri or the, the silo in Edgeroy and silos in Balada, then there, those gateways would essentially cover that entire area and it would mean that any of the, the um, farmers or others for sort of many tens of kilometres around uh, would all be able to just buy one of these sensors off the shelf and turn it on and it would work back through this open access radio technology network. Uh, it's, it's fantastic stuff. Uh, so the things network is what that's called. Um, now we've been setting up uh, the things network or TTN gateways as we go. Um, and I understand that uh, John Bateman guy, the, the team at the uh, plant breeding institute there have a number of gateways. Likewise, out at Mile Vale at the Cotton Research, and I actually think it's uh, DPI gateways, not CSIRO, as I had said there. Um, but these things are starting to appear, um, but for a very modest investment, you can set one of them up on the roof of your shed or the silo, and then whatever sensors you put on your farm or your neighbours or, or whoever, uh, then that sensor is able to report in real time. I've just got a couple of... Uh, brief examples as, as I started to get familiar with this technology. Uh, so one is a temperature logger in the swimming pool, uh, just a tiny box there with the small solar panel and that just reports every 15 minutes or so. Uh, likewise, um, the data there is a little bit patchy because I uh, this was the first one I've set up and I'm getting a bit of condensation on the sensor. I need to ventilate that a little better. Uh, but that is an ultrasonic sensor for measuring how full water tanks are. Um, I quickly added this in when I saw that fantastic work that uh, uh, Kate mentioned about the feral pig monitoring. Uh, now, I'm not sure what technology was being used to report those 
feral pig locations, but certainly you could do that with uh, Laura Wan and say, this is something I put together for my dog. Um, so when the dog wanders, I know where it's wandered to. Um, and again, there's no SIM card or, or costs associated with this. It's all just using those open access protocols. Um, and likewise, of course, uh, soil moisture probes. Uh, so there's any number of different sensors available, uh, including, of course, uh, the weather stations, uh, the ones we've got available, and I'm sure from others can work either uh, on, on the commercial mobile phone network or using this kind of open access uh, uh, law aware network as well. Uh, so just try and wrap up um, some of the things that I've been trying to touch on uh, is that uh, now definitely is the right time to start to think about instrumenting your farm. Uh, but I think it's important also just to have clarity about what it is you really want. So uh, the, the raw data itself is only useful if you've got the right hooks in place or the right sensors in place to help you to make sensible farming decisions. Um, I, again, advocate these open standards um, or open access to information like the, the weather station observations um, or setting up open access infrastructure uh, like the Laura Wan gateways um, so that you and the entire community all benefit. Um, and uh, I really look forward to some of the talks that are coming up both this afternoon and in the days ahead, which are going to go into a lot more detail about some of the things that are available. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, David. That was really good summary of uh, some possible technologies. And as you mentioned there, look, there are a number of these sort of Laura Wan networks around of around the districts and around farming areas. And I think one of the interesting comments you made was really about the open access, because there's a lot of debate around that in the, about private access and open access. And I, I believe there's no doubt in terms of the example you gave with weather data, we all benefit from open access. You, you soon work out if your data's spurious or not and uh, can make better decisions. You gave some good examples there. So you've got an email there on the screen. You can get in contact with Chris if you've got any questions or, or David, and we can direct that to him. So thanks very much, David. I'd now like to move to our final speaker for this morning's or this afternoon's session, which is um, Fiona Weingarten. Now, Fiona is, uh, has a background in cotton and broadacre agronomy, having grown up on a farm in northwest New South Wales and also worked uh, in several towns across northwest in the Guaira and Namoy Valleys and spent the last three years specialising in precision agriculture. So Fiona's now heading up the precision agricultural arm of Outlook Ag, servicing Narrabri, Walgett and the Liverpool Plains. And she's just going to provide some, a snapshot, if you like, of some examples of what some of the, the best growers or leading adopters are doing in ag tech and, and where to next. So thanks, Fiona, and welcome. Thanks very much, Guy. I'll just put this on. Oh. <clears throat> there we go rightio so yeah just as guy said we'll um basically just run through pretty much how we're approaching precision ag at the moment and where we're up to um and some of the sort of practical applications that we're um putting in at the moment so um, everyone sort of covered this fairly well, but just a little bit of a rundown of um, the sort of spatial data that we're using in Outlook Ag. Obviously, satellite imagery, there are many different providers. Um, from, to my mind, the things you probably need to consider if you're deciding which way you want to go with satellite imagery, consider things like revisit frequency, how often do the satellites come over, uh, what resolution are they? So you've got things like daily, weekly, 10 days, you know, three metre, five metre, 10 metre, um, you know, different spectral bands on those and obviously the price of that imagery. There's a lot of stuff out there, um, but there's a lot of different levels for different um, intensity, I guess, of what you're looking to do. So the crux of that is what resolution do you need and what resolution can you actually physically respond to at a paddock level? 
Um, there's a lot of different ways of assessing those images. So looking at individual images for a bit of a snapshot view, but also looking at those field trends. So um, paddock changes from one image to the next and things like that. Um, obviously the logical uh, follow on from that is a VR prescription, whether that's in crop or you know pre-crop starter fertilizer, things like that, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and there's a lot of um, power to analyze trials on the go in season as well as at the other end of the season with your yield data. Um, and depending on your um, imagery provider, there are a lot of different um, types of imagery that you can look at. It's more than just NDVI equals biomass. There are a few different um, types of images that have, a, have better fits than others at different parts of the season or for different purposes. Um, obviously, yield data is a really great starting point for anyone that's just sort of dipping their toe into precision ag. Um, we all know that we've got variability in our fields, but until you have a quality yield map, it's really hard to quantify the extent of that variability. Um, so using yield data, especially if you've got multiple years worth of yield data, we can have a look at the effect of different crop types, crop sequences, um, variety trials, soil type changes, basically all sorts of things. But as mentioned earlier, you know, that quality of the data um, is a real sticking point and making sure that the trends that you're pulling out of that data are actually telling you what you think they're telling you. Um, and, you know, your biggest crunch points with yield data, harvest is always a pretty hectic time of year. Um, and so, bringing together multiple machines, different brands, um, different screen setups. There's sort of a myriad of different um, setups you might come across. Um, I know a lot of conversations that happen these days with contractors, you know, there is a, an agreement that yield data is part of the service. Um, so it's, it's becoming a more and more impo important part of the everyday running of harvest um, these days. But the actual collation of that data um, and bringing it together and making sense of it is a fairly time consuming but important part of the process. Um, and one of the the sort of key pitfalls, I guess, that we come across is when people um, will give you yield data in the form of a PDF, um, which is not necessarily a usable format. It doesn't really matter what um, platform or service you're using to look at your yield data. A PDF um, is really just a pretty picture. What we're looking for are things that have come straight out of the head of it, whether it's on a USB stick from my John Deere, um, something that's in like a, a CSV or a CM1 file, whatever it may be, but something that actually has the nuts and bolts and the data behind it rather than just pictures on a page. <clears throat> um, so obviously our uh, other spatial data that we're dealing with, sort of more physical surveys. So you've heard a bit about AM38, radiometrics. Um, a lot of different uh, uh, analytes and things can be sort of collected from that, but a, a key part of that is obviously understanding um, the timing and the calibration to, again, measure what you think you're measuring, um, and obviously the cost and time to specifically run that pass. Um, one really nice sort of easy next step for a lot of what we're doing is uh, using elevation data which if you can collect that elevation data from say a tractor pass, tillage, um, planting, something on a three point linkage ideally, as opposed to from spray rigs and headers and things, um, it's, you're going over the paddock already. So it's not a specific extra pass. There's no extra time and money involved. Um, and you can get quite, quite nice elevation data that you can do quite a lot with. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, sort of building on what David was talking about with open source data, there actually is quite a lot of um, open source LIDAR elevation data in this region. So we've got quite a nice bit of coverage of LIDAR data in the area. Um, but again, there's a bit of uh, specialized time and processing and skill in actually processing that into a format that you can use on your farm. Um, when we talk about elevation layers, it's sort of not just, um, you know, 165 to 168 meters or whatever it may be. It's looking at the different um, relationships within a field of how that elevation actually expresses itself. So whether you've got 
valleys, hollows, ridges, um, all sorts of things. So there's, you know, we, we look at landscape change a little bit, which which looks at a specific uh, point in a field, compares where it sits uh, with, you know, say a 250 metre radi radius around that point and whether it's physically above or below the average elevation for that area. And what that ends up giving us is a map of hollows versus ridges, so areas that shed water, areas that pool water. Um, and that's often a little bit more informative when looking at, say, like a yield by landscape change as opposed to yield by straight elevation. Um, and this sort of gives us a better indication of the way that, you know, water behaves, um, cold air might move in terms of frost and, um, yeah, things like that in terms of sort of picking the eyes out of your data and kind of building the story as you go through. <laughs> So sort of building on to that, um, basically any one image will not sort of tell you the whole story. So we know that there's, we know the importance of, of ground truthing, but it's also important that when you're looking at a yield layer that you can validate the variability in that field, you know that it's not, you know, a machine issue. It could be a harvest date issue, which could very well have affected um, yield collected off that field, but was it something that you can manage or is that just a feature of that season? Um, so it takes a fair bit of um, consultation with the people who are on the ground, people who have worked with that crop for the season um, and understanding what the variability is and what are the sources of the variability. And then is it something that we can sort of dig through and, and work out how to manage? So I guess a fairly, um, common comparison that you might do is variety X versus variety Y. Um, and so at a surface level, you might say, okay, well, variety X has out yielded Y. And then what we want to do is kind of dig a little bit deeper than that. So um, try and see, well, how did variety X go on the risers versus the hollows? Was one, you know, more susceptible to waterlogging or, um, you know, different things like that. So that you're not just, because of, I guess, the the inherent variability within fields and commercial size trials. Um, you're wanting to dig through, I guess, some of the inherent variability of the field to make sure that you're actually comparing uh, like for like in those comparisons. So this is a, a nice example of that where we had some Patrick versus Captain um, last year. And so this area to the east here is um, the Captain. And visually it looks like it has done that little bit better. Um, and then that, you know, very basic analysis would agree with that. It, it did have an advantage over hat trick in general. Um, what was interesting is the comments from the agros in the field and also the boys on the header was that the uh, captain looked to be doing quite a bit worse in the wetter parts of the field. So we sort of dug into that a little bit further. And what we found was uh, looking at landscape change and soil type variability. So we can use a, a bare soil image um, and run an RGBI index over that, which basically gives us a bit of a categorization of lighter soils to darker soils um, or lighter to heavier soils within that field. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but a lower number is a heavier soil. Um, and in this, in this particular field, the lighter soils are kind of that puggy, um, I don't know, higher water holding kind of soils. And so what we found was, yes, Captain did out yield uh, hat trick in a, few, in a few scenarios, but it really fell away in those more um, waterlogged areas, I guess. So, and I believe the boys observed, you know, things like phytophthora and, um, you know, heavier water logging and, and things like that in the Captain compared to the hat trick. So, what it sort of highlights is there's greater yield potential in one variety, but another may be more broadly suited to the conditions or a bit more stable in yield than, than the newer variety. And it's something that um, I guess we see a bit of in trying to understand, you know, the weaknesses of new varieties in those first couple of seasons as they're coming out. So this is a nice little analysis to kind of dig into why did we get the results that we got um, and making the the analysis line up with um, 
the observations that you've seen in the field. Um, another nice thing we can do, so this is using some of Smarty's um, PCP software. Um, what we can do is we can set up a trial that we can keep in the system for multiple years and run multiple yield map analysis under those same trials. So this paddock is a deep ripping trial. So the yellow strips were untreated and the blue strips were had a deep ripping pass in 2020. Um, and so we can see there's, there's certainly a yield advantage in year one. There's a very slight yield advantage in year two. Um, we're looking at, you know, given the, the price of those commodities at the time, we've got, we've had a win, but it's a pretty, a pretty modest win as far as return on investment goes. Um, but it's nice, it's nice to be able to have those trials set in place and, and track the impact of those things um, over a longer period of time and really, you know, drill down into um, the effect of these different trials and things. Um, obviously, this one's that's just kind of nice to look at, but um, VR prescriptions are a, a fairly commonplace um, use for our imagery these days, and it's something that's nice and tangible we can see in crops. So obviously, um, in cotton crops, uh, picks, so uh, plant growth regulators are a really nice fit, given that our imagery is reflecting biomass really quite well. Um, so it's a fairly logical step to go, right, oh, well, we'll put a heavier rate of picks on these heavier biomass areas and a lower rate of picks on these areas that are behind. So that's a fairly um, quick and easy and actionable um, application, I guess, to the nice pictures that we're seeing on the screen. And then what we see that translating to is a much more uniform crop. And, you know, in many times if we've got, um, you know, the conditions going with us, it might save us having a defoliation that, that drags on and on because we've got lush spots in the crop or you know things like that um, and obviously you know we can make prescriptions for ground rigs for planes depending on their setup um, for spreaders for planters basically um, if the machinery is enabled to take a VR prescription there's a lot of different things that we can that we can do with that um, things like fertilizer and ameliorants and things usually you'd want to um, use things like strategic or zoned or grid soil samples to drive the rate decisions in that situation or, um, yeah, whatever other soil surveys you might have. But it's all sort of about optimising your inputs um, and putting, I guess, the fertiliser or the soil ameliorants where they need to go. And I know that um, Mitch on our team is going to go into um, you know, the lime application side of things in the next couple of days when he speaks. Um, this is some fairly new stuff that Smarty's been doing in terms of trying to fill gaps. So the, like with the inherent um, limitation, just about every year you'll have a header that doesn't record or you'll have gaps in your data for whatever reason. Um, so what he has developed is a bit of a tool where if we can find a nice correlation between an in-season image and an actual yield map, a good yield map sort of in the vicinity of the field where we're missing data, we can actually create an equation that we can then apply to said field with the missing data and come up with a modelled yield map. So this is something that's quite new and we've been having a bit of a play with um, in the last couple of months since harvest. Um, we're reasonably happy with um, how it's actually helping us to sort of fill some gaps and, and work out some stories in terms of, you know, yield variability or, you know, nutrient removal across a field where we've got some significant gaps. So in this situation, the image on the left here is an in-crop um, image and the image on the right is your an actual chickpea yield. So there's a fairly nice looking correlation just visually there. We've got sort of a lot of those main high and low points sort of lining up between those two. And so then he runs a, a correlation over those. So it's brought us up with an R squared of 0.7. Um, this line will sort of indicate whether it's a usable equation or not. The, obviously, the higher the R squared, um, the better the eventual outcome. 
um, and occasionally it's just a case of finding, you know, a good enough image. In this case, um, we have this field here where we had a header not work and we knew that we had an irrigation change um, in this paddock. So this bottom section was watered and the rest of it was left dry land um, and we could see it lining up perfectly with where that irrigation happened, but um, obviously we we're missing a fair bit of data in there. So applied this applied this equation. So I guess the key caveats are that it's same crop type um, and within a reasonable radius. So these two fields are about 20 kilometres apart. Um, I don't think you'd want to go any more than about about that. I think it, he can go up to 50, but it's sort of one of those regional things, you know, east or west of the highway, just those um, local knowledge type um, approaches to things where whether you, it's applicable or not, I guess. Um, but yeah, in this scenario, we've been able to use this um, equation to model this yield and we can actually compare it to the data that we do have. So we can still see some nice trends lining up here and it's just giving us a better idea of what that yield map probably looks like. So as far as a tool that we're evaluating, we're, um, we're pretty happy with how it's looking. It's obviously not a replacement for um, good quality yield data. But as far as a tool um, for making those assessments and, you know, running some numbers on, um, you know, potential yield loss or things like that, um, yeah, it's it's really quite uh, quite a nice tool to see in the mix. Um, using some of the Terra Cutter um, software, so this is looking at elevation um, and versus yield. So uh, we uh, go out as far as Walgett, and obviously that's a fairly um, flat area. Um, you know, it's it's pretty minor undulations out there, but what we're hearing is that, um, and what the boys are seeing out there is that there really is quite a lot of yield variation by elevation in, in certain seasons, and they're, they're getting quite a lot of, you know, frost issues and waterlogging issues um, out there surprisingly so for an area that's that we tend to consider fairly flat. So um, this image that's on here is actually a 3D elevation model that's then had the uh, yield map overlaid on it and then a water model um, a, a water model run over it. So you can see here the areas where water is pooling, it might not be getting away. Um, and so what we're, I guess, toying with is are there ways that we can manage both water logging and potentially even frost movement um, by identifying these areas uh, using this sort of 3D water mod modelling technology. Um, this kind of goes into your soil type interaction as well. So in this image, your, uh, your red parts of the field here are the heavier soil types, the green parts of the field here are the lighter soil types. Um, and what we can see is a soil type by landscape change interaction. So through each of these is hollows in the negative through to ridges in the positive. So in our heavy soil type and that kind of mid-range soil type, we've seen a response to landscape change in yield, but in that lighter soil type, it's a bit more stable. So there's a couple of, I guess, um, thoughts we have about what could be driving that, whether it's you know, frost and water logging or whether, you know, in those lighter soil types, perhaps the crop was that much more mature when that frost event happened, um, giving us sort of avenues to start investigating as to how we might be able to manage and minimise some of those variability in that field. Um, so this is sort of just the side by side. This is the raw elevation data. And then that, that's that water modelling um, image there again. So you know, the sort of thought bubble coming out of this office is that we uh, could potentially, you know, mitigate some of this risk by creating a bit of a, a drainage channel through these fields, uh, sacrifice a small part of the field, but direct that water back out of the field and hopefully even direct that cool air back out of the field um, and minimise, you know, the impacts of, of you know, frost and water logging out there. Um, and then this is kind of building on some of the stuff we've seen with, you know, your camera and drone and whatever else, but it's using that satellite imagery to come up with a VR 
weed control approach. Um, so we had a pretty clear uh, biomass indication of uh, feather top and barnyard grass that had gotten out of control in February 2020. Um, so from there, we just pulled it into a fairly simple free zone um, application map. And we have a VR first knock, VR second knock approach here. So I guess the nuts and bolts of this is we're looking at the comparison between the cost of doing this on a VR basis versus going on a blanket basis to get that level of control. Um, and so once we work out the paddock average, so you know your average rates of each product, once you factor in these zone areas, um, you know there's a saving of $22.50 a hectare over the course of those two passes, um, which over a, you know a 400 hectare paddock is a pretty significant saving. Um, and as far as the result goes, I guess the alternative for that cost was a single pass of glyphosate and verdict versus on the left hand side here, this is your VR double knock option. So I guess in a general sort of um, sense in what we're facing for the seasons to come, you know, we've got skyrocketing input prices at the moment. Um, it makes a lot of sense to be looking at variable rate options to be optimising those inputs um, and trying to lower that cost per hectare where we can. Um, and that's probably about the crux of it for us. Um, I guess my main message is, yeah, usable data is key. Um, we, try and, we try and get away from um, just, you know, pretty pictures on a page. Um, really having context for the image that you're looking at very rarely will will one image tell you the wrong story or it's very easy to go down a rabbit hole um, if we're not looking at you know multiple layer analysis um, the big one in my experience is that getting getting growers to engage in the pa process and and fairly consistently as well um, it's a big hurdle but essentially any platform as as dave said earlier you know rubbish data in rubbish data out it's the same thing with being able to use and feel comfortable with these PA platforms. Um, if you come to it once, twice a year after harvest, it's it's going to be a fairly um, tedious process because there is a fair bit involved in them. But even if you can just, you know, make a habit of looking at your imagery every couple of weeks and, and feeling comfortable with the platform, um, I think we tend to see that there's a lot, a lot better conversion of, you know, um, uptake to actually results in return on investment where you can really engage with the platform. Um, and yeah, internet speed is obviously a fairly consistent limitation in this area. Perhaps there's something around the Laura Wen area that that can help us with that, um, you know, outside of town. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of where we're up to in the PA space and some of the things that that we're looking at and doing with those layers. Well, thank you, Fiona, for sharing. You know, you gave many examples there of what what growers and agronomists are potentially doing in northwest New South Wales in the cropping sector, and but also what some of their riches are in terms of uh, things and hurdles and barriers that uh, we could all try and resolve going forward. So we've run out of time today, so I'm going to call a time here in a minute. But I think we could take up that discussion later on in this series. So on, if you remember Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday at 12.30, this Thursday we're doing cropping in more detail and next Tuesday livestock and then we'll try and bring it all together with some of that provenance and, and market traceability the following Thursday and then we'll have a discussion. So thank you very much to our speakers, Alex, George, Kate, David and Fiona. I'll give them a clap and thank you very much to you all for listening both here online and those who will listen to the recording later. And of course, if you have any questions, well, if you can't contact the speakers directly, feel free to send them to myself or my colleagues and we'll, we'll direct the traffic for you. And I, so thanks a lot. Have a great day and we'll see you as soon as we can. Bye for now.